My Midrash on Isaiah 65. Verse 1. I responded to those who did not ask. I was at hand to those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not invoke my name. My commentary on this part, I responded to those who did not ask. I was at hand to those who did not seek me. God is saying that even with all of his people gone astray, not following the teaching of God's servant Moses, whom God charged at Orb with laws and rules for all of Israel, that he was still there for them. God espoused the Jewish people, married them, and would never turn from them despite even the entire nation not following his laws and rules. <clears throat> a spouse, again, means to adopt as one's children and marry as one's bride. Verse 2, I constantly spread out my hands to a disloyal people who walked a way that is not good following their own designs. Verse 3, the people who provoke my anger, who continually to my very face, sacrifice in gardens and burn incense on tiles. Verse 4, who sit inside tombs and pass the night in the secret places, who eat the flesh of swine with broth of unclean things in their bowls. This is written first for the people of antiquity in words they can understand and that apply to their life. You'll see as we go on that this starts referring to the, the, the returned dispersal of Rome, the diaspora. Everything from Isaiah chapter 51, when he takes his cup of wrath, his bowl of reeling from his people, the Jewish people, and passes it to those who told them to get down on the ground and walked all over them. It's primarily Christianity, but it's the Gentiles in general. Verse 5, who say, keep your distance, don't come closer, for I would render you consecrated. Such things make my anger rage like fire blazing all day long. Okay, from that verse, who say, keep your distance, don't come closer, for I would render you consecrated? Okay, the Jewish people have completely turned their back to God. If they would turn back to him in this chapter, <laughs> not necessarily right now. If they would turn back to him, he would dedicate them formally to a religious or divine purpose. Verse 6, see, this is recorded before me. I will not stand idly by, but will repay, deliver their sins into their bosom. Okay, I will not stand idly by, but will repay, deliver their sins into their bosom. God will punish the Jewish people for turning their back to him and being guilty of disregarding his teachings, laws, and rules. But he will not leave them. Verse 7. And the sins of their fathers as well, said the Lord, for they made offerings upon the mountains and affronted me upon the hills. I will count out their recompense in full into their bosoms. Okay, now that's interesting because you don't hear that very often that the children are going to be punished for the sins of the fathers. And it says, in the sins of the fathers, this is from a proverb that is not in the Hebrew Bible and done away with in the book of Ezekiel. This is from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean quoting this proverb upon the soil of Israel? Parents eat sour grapes and their children's teeth are blunted. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no longer be current among you in Israel. Consider all lives are mine. The life of the parent and the life of the child are both mine. The person who sins, only he shall die. 
It's Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. So up until this time, the Israelites, the, the, the Jewish people, at, at this time, they're, they're still the Israelites. They don't become the Jews until they're all in exile and it occurs first in Persia. First time we see the name Jew. And it has nothing to do with Judah. Any more than Hebrew has anything to do with Judah. Uh, it is an E.W. What it is is the uh, pure blood of Hebrew became diluted during the exile of the, um, the Assyrian Babylonian exiles after Babylon destroyed the first temple and deported everybody in the North Kingdom had already been deported to those same lands uh, much earlier than that. But that's the first time we see the story of Esther, and that's the first time her uncle, I believe it is, is Mordecai the Jew. Just like it was Abraham the Hebrew. He just That's just the name he wanted his chosen people to be known by. So anyway, everybody dies for their own sins. There's no atoning for others, which I, I know the Jewish people, uh, rabbis, they tell the Christians this all the time. God doesn't accept that. That's not his teaching, that anyone can atone for another. Everybody's responsible for their own sins. Verse 8, thus said the Lord, it's when the new wine is present in the cluster. One says, don't destroy it. There's good in it. So will I do for the sake of my servants and not destroy everything. Okay, as when the new wine is present in the cluster, one says, don't destroy it, there's good in it. This analogy is between the cluster of grapes and the Jewish people. Grapes that have ripened for wine in the cluster of bad grapes to goodness. And many of the Jewish people, among many more who disregard God's teaching, laws, and rules. Applying this psalm to today, if Elijah purpose prospers, when God comes, he will not bring utter destruction and throw out the whole cluster with the good grapes. Verse 9, I will bring forth offspring from Jacob, from Judah, heirs to my mountains, my chosen ones to take possession. My servants shall dwell, dwell their own. Okay, taking this part. My chosen ones shall take possession. My servants shall dwell their own. Okay, today, this is the return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel from the Roman dispersal that brings God's return in the day of the Lord. Uh, in the book of Jeremiah, see a time is coming, the land blooms again. See a time is coming, Jerusalem's rebuilt. See a time is coming, I make a new covenant with you. Where do we find this new covenant? You look at the last page of the prophets, Malachi 3. God says, I'm coming. I'm sending my messenger to clear the way before me, who is Elijah. And the angel of the covenant that you desire is already on the way. There's the covenant. That's the time to come, the day of the Lord, and that day is today. Verse 10, Sharon shall become a pasture for flocks in the valley of Achor, for cattle to lie down, for people who seek me. Sharon becomes a pasture for flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for cattle to lay down. Okay, the Sharon plain is near Tel Aviv. And the valley of Achor is near Jericho, both in the lands of the northern kingdom. And that's how you know this is not for the Assyrian Babylonian exiles. The northern kingdom was inhabited by Gentiles that were imported when the northern kingdom was deported by Assyria. It doesn't apply to them. This is the entirety of the promised lands. Now, Israel today, the state, the country, doesn't comprise all the promised lands, but, but it's, it's definitely in the north and south kingdom. Okay, I said Psalm a minute ago. This is, a cha this is chapter 65 of Isaiah. <clears throat> 
and what I was referring to was the song that where that proverb came from. I should have said proverb. This chapter 65, like all the chapters of Isaiah, from 51 to 66, pertain to the Roman dispersal in the day of the Lord. Okay, for my people who seek me, that's the Jewish people who heed and revere the Lord, esteem his name, who desire to be written to the scroll of remembrance for entry to God's spiritual heaven prepared in the day of the Lord. This is all in Malachi 3. I mean, the, um, it's where he discusses that. God does. The Middle Ages and the common era in general is much different than the heaven of the scroll of remembrance I have been told. No one of this generation will see any one of biblical times in heaven. And the Lord tells me we would not want to. They, they were illiterate. Uh, you know, nobody can read. Life was just, can, can I get through this day with some food and shelter? And uh, no police, no anything. If you had stuff, people took it from you. And that will be revealed more as I go on. And what's special about this heaven, for this day of the Lord, which I believe begins, and, and God is, as so much as indicated, 1957, when the dawning of the age of the internet, when the Russians sent up the first satellite, Sputnik. It's also the year I was born. But with me is the angel of the covenant, it's the angel of his presence. The covenant is the new covenant, Jeremiah 31. Though they don't know it, every Jew on the face of the planet is sin free. Okay, they had to understand this before God says, okay, I cleaned your slate, now let's start being observant Jews and get back to synagogue or go to synagogue for the first time, if this be the case. And he did this for the Syrian Babylon exiles when they returned by writing, Isaiah's writing, he forgave their sins. And what did they do? They became a holy seed and they built a second temple. Well, we have another temple to build. God's covenant of friendship says, I'm going to place my sanctuary amongst you. That's, all, that's also in Ezekiel. So he knew when he had Ezekiel write that, that in the day of the Lord, when the land blooms again, there's not going to be a temple. He already knows that. So that means if everybody's forgiven and with a clean slate, that's just a different generation of people. That's why heaven is different for this generation. Though it's just going to be a more beautiful, wonderful heaven is what it comes down to than there has ever been before for any of the sets of generations. Antiquity had theirs. The Dark Ages had theirs. The Age of Enlightenment, let's just say up to the Holocaust, had theirs. The Holocaust has their own. And then there's this day. We started, as I said, uh, Israel was created in 48. Part of God's covenant is that he would uh, uh, make a planting of renown. In other words, he's, his power, his, uh, a gift from God is that he has assisted Israel in making uh, the land bloom again. For his return. It's very simple. He just says, when y'all come back, I'm going to come back to you. That's all that's about. Okay, the scroll of remembrance is being written. And on the day, this is uh, from Ezekiel, I mean Malachi, and on the day that I'm preparing, said the Lord of hosts, they shall be my treasured possession. That's those who revere and esteem the name of the Lord in the day of the Lord. They'll be his treasured possession. I will be tender toward them as a man is tender toward a son who ministers to him. And you shall come to see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between him who has served the Lord and who whom, whom has not served him. Okay, he's referring to a spiritual heaven at this point. The spiritual heaven he gives us in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 1 and 10. Now, antiquity, the sages, the town, they don't recognize the spiritual heaven. 
they see nothing but chapter 37 of Ezekiel where you have the vision of uh, uh, old bones rise and there's a resurrection vision. That's, that's for the people of antiquity. That's, that's, that's not today. That's for people who were so illiterate they would just go out and stare at the ground where their loved one was buried and, and just wait for them. It's like they'd sit in cemeteries all night. I just read a reference to that. What do you, because that's all they knew. Just come back. Just come back and be alive. You know? With our knowledge in science and medicine, uh, we know better. Human bodies aren't going to be reconstructed from the dust and ashes of dead bodies. It's just not going to happen. And if it did happen in Israel today, as Judaism teaches, that comes from antiquity, you'd have billions of people to be taken care of. All of them, for the most part, illiterate. You'd have Israelites. You'd have those that lived in Egypt for 400 years. That God had to tell them what sin was and to cook your food. Don't eat the blood. You know, you don't want those people running around Israel. It's bad enough having Palestinians. And also in Malachi, for lo, that day is at hand, burning like an oven. All the arrogant and all the doers of evil shall be straw. And the day that is coming, says the Lord of hosts, shall burn them to ashes and leave them neither stock nor bowels. But for you who revere my name, a son of victory shall rise to bring healing. You shall go forth and stamp like stall-fed calves. This is, this is talking about a spiritual heaven, but it's written in the, in, in the words of antiquity for their kind of heaven. We defeat all of our enemies. That's what the day of the Lord has always uh, been in six other books until Malachi. When he says, I'm coming with sin forgiveness. I'm not coming to destroy evil. I'm going to write down those who want to be observant and revere and esteem me. And I'm going to put them into a scroll of remembrance. It's just totally unlike all the days of the Lord previously mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. It's his final word on it. And it, uh, again, it all comes back to, you, you know, the Talmud is wonderful. God uh, uh, thinks it's wonderful. But, it, but, but it's not where your teaching should come from. Your teaching should come from the Scripture. And the rabbis today rely almost solely on people like Rambam of the Middle Ages and his interpretations of the Talmud. And, you know, they, they pray for a resurrection of the dead or that they have a belief in it. You know, uh, things that just aren't meant for this day of enlightenment, reasoning, knowledge, information, science, medicine. Okay, so all that came from Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Picking back up with chapter 65, verse 11. But as for you who forsake the Lord, who ignore my holy mountain, who set a table for luck and fill a mixing bowl for destiny, verse 12, okay, but as for you, who, uh, my commentary on that verse, but as for you who forsake the Lord, okay, that's the arrogant the doers of evil and the wicked that he makes reference in Malachi. Okay, if, if you were to take this chapter 65 and say, okay, that applies to the Roman dispersal who's back in the day of the Lord. That's what you would call them. Those who do not go into the scroll of remembrance. Verse 12, I will destine you for the sword. You will all kneel down to be slaughtered. Because when I called, you did not answer. When I spoke, you would not listen. You did what I hold evil and choose what I do not want. Okay, remember, when he comes back, first thing he's doing is having a reckoning with the rabbis. He puts them in the category of those who do not heed him, revere, or steal his name, esteem his name. Even though they're sin free, they practice observant Judaism. By all accounts, they should be going into the scroll of remembrance, but they will not. Because that's why God says they are dismissed. 
And he's got all kinds of purposes in that. One is straighten out your teachings on this messianic era and heed my prophet. He's described in Isaiah 53, which is not by any stretch of the imagination the Jewish people as the man Israel. And he knew they'd be teaching that. Oh, yes, he did. In other words, they're going to have to help me because I'm that man. If they, if they want to get back in right standing, that's the teaching of the righteous servant. Everybody's forgiven. I have to get that message out there in my capacity as Elijah. But everybody's forgiven. So how does the righteous servant make many righteous? i let you know you've got to be in right standing also. And that it's just a clearing of your slate. You're not always forgiven of your sins, as I believe the Christians think they are. Um, if they stray after accepting Jesus, they can always get it re-erased. <laughs> I guess by re-accepting him or something. I, they, they tell me, well, Jesus knew you, the sins you would make after accepting him, and he forgave those two. I said, okay. Sin, you, know, you can do whatever you want then. The heck with God's laws. Live your life any way you want. You know, those laws are for us. He knows it's a harsh world. They're for us. It's not for him. He says, you know, if you, if you live your life as an observant Jew, you're going to have a whole lot better life than you would have if you weren't. It just needs to be brought to the modern age and re <laughs> relieved of antiquity. And again, you will all kneel down and be slaughtered. The day of the Lord, burning like an oven, shall burn them to ashes. Okay, death in this context means you will not have eternal life. He's not going to, you know, we're not talking about the good people going to kill all the bad people in the day of the Lord. Again, antiquity to death, there's no difference. And because when I called you did not answer, when I spoke you would not listen, God calls through his prophet, and he, the prophet, is answering. It's not walking at your door and saying, I'm going to do God's will this day. And the first, first thing you do is say, is God asking me to do something through his prophet? This is how he communicates to the earth, to, to human beings, to his chosen people. This is what the Hebrew Bible is about. Now, I'm the only person who's ever been able to explain all this and how it is that the angel of the Lord's in the burning bush and God speaks. How a man in divine beings wrestles with Jacob and God speaks and changes his name to Israel. I have all the answers. Just like Elijah would have all answers of things from heaven. Verse 13. Assuredly, thus said the Lord God, My servant shall eat and you shall hunger. My servant shall drink and you shall thirst. This is the evildoers versus the self-head cast. My servant shall drink and you shall thirst. My servant shall rejoice and you shall be ashamed. Verse 14. I don't have anything to say about that. My servant shall shout in gladness and you shall cry out in anguish, howling in heartbreak. You shall leave behind a name by which my chosen ones shall curse. So may the Lord God slay you, but his servant shall be given a different name. You shall leave behind a name. Okay, they're going to be called the wicked, arrogant, evils, uh, doers of evil. From Malachi 3. By which my chosen ones, God's chosen the day of the Lord, are the Jewish people who are righteous, observant, and right standing with God and chosen to be written into the scroll of remembrance. The chosen of the chosen. But his servant should be given a different name. Okay? They're going to be called righteous stall-fed calves. Or in Malachi 3. Verse 16. For whosoever blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the true God. And whoever swears in the land shall swear by the true God. The former troubles shall be forgotten, shall be hidden from my eyes. That's the important part, that last sentence. The former troubles shall be forgotten, shall be hidden from my eyes. The new covenant is delivered and announced in the day of the Lord. 
where the sins and inequities of the Jewish people are forgiven and remembered no more. Which, in other words, the former trouble shall be forgotten. Your sins are, you know, remember them no more. Hidden from my eyes. Verse 17, for behold, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. Again, scroll of remembrance, heaven, written in times of antiquity and their belief in resurrection of the dead, very little belief in spiritual heaven. Uh, it's, it's not taught in Judaism. And uh, in those days, generally, everything bad that happened to you was thought to be because God was angry. The belief that you would rise to heaven and live with God just wasn't prevalent. For behold, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. It will be when this earth ceases. He'll have a new heaven. The former things shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. For behold, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. Okay, the ultimate purpose of God, ultimate purpose, not all purposes, he tells us here in Isaiah 65, with creation is to bring into existence a new spiritual heaven. How? It's by the addition of a new host of angels. The angels of Israel, the Jewish people. And begin the whole thing all over again with the new earth. Which, by the way, is your television in heaven. You get to watch the new earth being formed. And not only that, because he showed me in vision. The very room I'd be in. The very bay window I'd look out at and watch this world be created. And then he creates man. You get to see that, and then he chooses another chosen people. He's going to do the same thing. He said, it's perfect when I did it, and I'm going to do it again. They'll have different names. They don't necessarily be called Jews. They could be, but uh, it'll be a chosen people. And so the Jewish people get to sit back and relax and say, let's see how this thing really unfolds. That, that's pretty neat. And there's meeting places. Again, I am also Elijah. And, uh, and, and as the prophet like Moses, God dictated everything I'm saying to you. God dictated to me in the book, The Life of God's Righteous Servant. He also dictated the book to me as he dictated the Torah to Moses. Um, Isaiah 53, In the Day of the Lord. That's where all my videos come from, is these two books. Plus he teaches me on the fly, so to speak. I'm always learning new things. Judgment day for entry to heaven is when the earth no longer exists as we know it. And again, the description for a spiritual heaven is found in Ezekiel 1 and 10. And I learned about this in vision too. Uh, basically, the eyes that are in the wheel works and the eyes that are on the creatures, the angels, the cherubims, it is said in chapter 10, and lifted and lifted to the house of God. God stands above them, and there's a reference to a throne. Okay, the eyes are, the, are people. Two eyes to a person. That's what that is. He took me out into the galaxy, and I realized I was in vision, in spirit. It was the first time I was in spirit and not in body. And uh, when I went to my room in heaven, I was in body. And, uh, but, you know, there was nothing there. And I felt like a pair of eyes just staring at the glorious galaxies. It was an incredible vision he gave me. And he didn't give me any warning before he, he took me to. We were just talking. Outside. We were outside at a park. I had just run three miles. And uh, off <laughs> up in the galaxy. And that night he said, read Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10. And the minute I saw eyes, I knew exactly what that was. That's spiritual heaven. God made humanity for his purposes. Humans are very flawed, and life on earth can be very harsh and painful. But to God, creation is perfect. The world and mankind are perfectly what he wanted for his purpose of creating a new heaven. A heaven filled with the spirits of the persons of the Jewish people who had self-will and their personalities formed through adversity, strife, oppression, and suffering, and following his teachings and laws and rules. That's his perfect world. That's not what Judaism teaches. 
They think the world's evolving to a point where the, the world's going to recognize that the Jews been writing about God on. Oh, the entire world's going to speak Hebrew, which is based on a misinterpretation of Scripture by Rambam, and uh, exalt the Jew and hold them up high. Not happening. It's not going to happen. This evolution, Toby Singer talks about where you, 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 humanity is, is heading towards that for this Messianic era. Well, it's been heading that way for 3,000 years. The descendant of David is here, and anti Semitism's up. And the world's not speaking Hebrew. The peoples of a pure speech, Rambam quotes, is not the peoples of the world. It's his peoples, the Jewish people in Israel. And guess what? They speak Hebrew. It's a prophecy fulfilled. God wants the last generation of the Jewish people on earth to also have their personalities formed through adversity, strife, oppression, suffering that comes from living on the earth as his people. Again, ultimate purpose of God. A new heaven. Why is it new? The addition of a host of angels. A new host. The angels Israel. The Jewish people. Because he says, I'm making a heaven where the name Israel shall endure. There's no heaven for the Gentiles. If they want to see heaven, they have to convert to Judaism and become Jews. That's all they got. Again, it's an option. In the Messianic era, this, this will never happen. All adversity and strife is gone. God doesn't want that. That's not, that's not his perfect world. And he says the perfect world Tobia talks about is not perfect. It won't work with human beings. Period. You've got to have competition. You've got to have people saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outdo that person. I'm going to be better. That, that, I'm mad. I'm angry. See, in, in the world that they're talking about, nobody gets angry. I don't know who does the work. You know, it never works. Reading a science fiction books, you'll figure it out. You cannot have utopia. Human beings are created for utopia. The former things, he says, shall not be remembered. They shall never come to mind. I think about that. What does he mean? In heaven, I won't remember my life on earth. That's correct. You're a new creature. You're you. You're the you you know, the person within that body that you're in. That's you. And you say, well, how, how will I know all about Jews and Judaism and Talmud and, and everything that anything and everything that's Jewish that this new heaven's about? You just do. And he's proven it to me. The thing is, he provides the information of your mind that your spirit, your person reads. You know, your, your spirit reads your mind. You're, your thoughts don't come from a bunch of electrochemical synapses and chemicals and tissue of the brain, gray matter, white matter. That's not where your thoughts are. No, it's from that God-given spirit that's in your human body that knows how to read the information in that brain that comes in from your eyes and your ears and your remembrance. And in heaven, you don't have a brain. You don't have a mind. It goes to the dust. He provides it. And I know these things because he's do, he does it with me. The normal workings of this human are now different. I'm a man in divine base. He supplies the information my mind would be supplying, but he's in control of what that is, which is how he can speak to me or have me always speak the words he wants me to speak. That includes right now. There's more on that on other videos. You're a new being with the knowledge you had on earth with a heavy emphasis on Judaism, all things Jewish, including the culture, history, and even food, though you will not need it or desire it. Okay, this is how he had me type this. You will not wonder how you know the things you do know or their source. God is the information of your mind, and that information will not include anything of the earth. He will not have you wonder about the source of your knowledge and you cannot without him. And you will know your loved ones without even thinking about why or when you first began to love them. He won't let those kind of thoughts come to you. You just know you loved them. It's incredible what he's doing with me. It's just incredible. A man in divine things. 
It's just me, God, and the angel of his presence, uh, the Holy Spirit. That's the same thing. Angel of his presence, Holy Spirit, same thing. It's an angel, and that angel's body is the Spirit of God. It's not a human form with wings. Judaism doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit of God to be a person, which is an absurdity. Because, you know, I mean, there's so much scripture that says the exact opposite. The, the Spirit of the Holy God went to Ezekiel and said, Speak. He's talking to speak. He's talking. That's the person. He gets greed. He gets angry if the, if the Jewish people don't... Uh, uh, obey God. He gets angry. He gets grieved by it. God says, don't grieve him. He won't forgive you. You know, this isn't your regular angel. <laughs> but anyway, and, he, and God says, for I shall create Jerusalem as a joy. He calls it Jerusalem for antiquity because they believed on this heaven on earth that, you know, that's what they believed in. Okay, now spiritual heaven as Judaism still teaches today. So he calls heaven, it can be used two ways. Today we look at that and say, oh, he means Jerusalem's heaven, spiritual heaven. And her people's a delight. And this is how God had me type it for the book which is unpublished. The beliefs, knowledge, and reasoning of the people of antiquity, including the sages and rabbis of the Talmud and Grand Am and Rashi, and into the Middle Ages were taken into consideration by God when he wrote this, had it written. They wanted a better, peaceful existence on earth to never feel grief and sadness for their babies and loved ones to return from the dead to live very long lives to build their homes and grow their crops without someone taking their homes and crops from them, to be free of first servitude, forced servitude made to build and plant for others, and to not fear their children would be taken from them into slavery. All these things show up in the final verses of chapter 25. For then God wrote inspirational poetry and songs and stories of a better time to come, inspirational prose in a time when surviving the day with having food and shelter, protecting your few possessions, was your existence. The people of the common era and ages of reasoning and information should recognize the inspirational prose for what it is and not necessarily prophecy to occur and their beliefs in such things as the resurrection of the dead. And, and again, not everything, it, it looks like prophecy, but if it cannot happen, the world's not going to love the Jew. There's no reason to believe there's being an evolution towards that. You know, I, God had me watch a tape of Topia Seeger, which I avoid at all costs. Had me watch it, and uh, there he is, saying uh, the, the intent from God all along was to take this imperfect mess, this imperfect world, and it would evolve into a perfect world based about primarily on uh, the Jews being a light to the world, I suppose. They can't get around, but they're saying, you know, Jews for Judaism says it, Rashi says it. They're talking about the Jews have atoned for the entire world to be at peace and love because of the suffering they endured. But what they always seem to forget, yeah, nobody, no, no culture that I can think of has ever suffered as the Jewish people have. But many cultures still aren't here anymore. Okay, that's a, that's a big suffering too when you get obliterated and exterminated. There's plenty of cultures from long, long ago that are no longer with us. I give you the mans, you know, which, which is and the, the Gentiles, the Christians, I mean, that, that's what I think of when I think of mans, human sacrifice. That's, that's the thing, man. But uh, there's no such evolution. It's perfect. It's exactly what it went. And he was showing, he, we, you know, we typed this and I learned this stuff years ago. And um, I had no idea that, that uh, Judaism uh, or uh, believed that, the, these things uh, that I just went over. This evolution, this uh, God's going to take an imperfect world and make it perfect. God, he'll say it again. Toby is saying it. My creation is perfect, just like it is. It's perfect for my purposes. Okay, that's God speaking through me. You can tell by the words. 
Sure, nobody believes me, but yeah. I got news for you. It doesn't bother him if you believe it or not. He's got a point to make. He's going to make it. He uses me to do it if he wants to, or he just has me say it. The Age of Reason was an 18th century movement which followed hard after the mysticism, religion, and superstition of the Middle Ages. This age represented a genesis. This is the Age of Enlightenment. This age represented a genesis in the way man viewed himself, the pursuit of knowledge, and the universe. Deism came to be. In this time, man's previously held concepts of conduct and thought could now be challenged. Which is what I'm doing with Judaism. I'm just telling you, you know, those, that, those were great concepts back then. But let's bring it to today. And there's no reason that Jews can't do this. All religions have a utopia at the end. Everybody does it. And as I mentioned earlier, they ne you know, it doesn't work. You can't have utopia with human beings. You can have a peaceful world, but everybody's holding on to their own stuff and saying it's peaceful because, you know, uh, but for all kinds of reasons. The reason the United States has been at peace since World War II, except for Vietnam, but uh, in Korea. Uh, fears of being labeled a heretic or being burned at the stake were finally done away with. You could speak to your mind about such matters. Deism is the belief in the existence of a supreme being, specifically of a creator who does not intervene in the universe. The term is used chiefly of the intellectual movement that accepted the existence of a creator based on reason. Somebody had to make this while rejecting the belief in a supernatural deity who interacts with humankind. Well, of course, they're wrong. God's doing it right now. He did it in the biblical times when he talked to his prophets and had his prophets speak to his people. And uh, he's doing it one more time. He's got one more message and teaching to get out there. And you're hearing it. And it gets simple rebuilt. Came back, he made the, night, the land nice, Jewish people. But where's God's house? He'd like to have his house back. There's reasons why this creature, this entity, not creature, this entity that God is, likes to be on the earth. I know the reasons for it, but I can't get into it right now. Uh, God has never changed the Jewish people to never sin and make them heed the sin and revere him in his power. How's he going to make the rest of the world? Why would he make the rest of the world do that? Because that's what it's going to take. You know, Rambam says uh, Moshiach shall have uh, performed no miracles, wonders, and this and that. Uh, well, how's he going to get in this done? How's he going to get the world to speak Hebrew? I mean, I'm him. I mean, am I to go to China and start there where one-third of humanity is speaking Chinese? Not only do I not speak Hebrew yet, I don't speak Chinese and I've got no intention of learning it. I've got my hands full learning Hebrew. The Messianic era is what the people of antiquity wanted, and the sages and rabbis of antiquity gave it to them. In exaltation, the Jewish people by the world, everyone speaking Hebrew and obeying the teaching laws and rules of the God of Israel and the resurrection of the dead. It's not going to happen. All at the expense of the day of the Lord. It's like it doesn't exist. Malachi 3 is just not in. It's just not part of the Messianic era. Where's that a destruction? If you don't heed the prophet. Yeah. Where's the rabbis when David's here and God grants his covenant of friendship and he has a reckoning with them, the shepherds, and dismisses them? I don't see that in their teachings. Very selective teachings. Where's the scroll for members? Where's other destruction? God sends an anointing one, not for a messianic era, not for the people to have all these great, wonderful things happen. No, he comes to be the Lord's representation and deliver another covenant, just like Moses. Everybody's forgiven, just like the exiles. It's just a bunch, you know, it's repeating stuff, and, and yet... Judaism has just made up chapters of the Bible that don't exist because they're not reading the Hebrew Bible properly.
and, you know, it's to be God's representation, to write His words, to speak His words, to explain the things that will happen and those that will not. And again, I've done so in these two books. The symbolism of a physical earth on earth continues in the remaining verses 19 through 25, where there is no grief or sadness, 19, infant mortality ended and people have long lives, 20. You could build your house and grow your crops and no one took them from you, enjoying both with long natural lives. That's verses 21 and 22. No one would take your children into slavery. That's verse 23. God would answer your prayers. Verse 24. And you could live peacefully without violence in your life. 25. The spiritual heaven, Ezekiel 1 and 10, was not seen by the sages and rabbis of antiquity and the dark ages. Uh, which I've already gone over. So, you know, summing up, and you can read those verses yourself. I am here with God in me to teach the rabbis today, among many other tasks, how to interpret the Bible by errors and ages for the sake of the people of the land of Israel. If the rabbis will teach the matters of my two books dictated to me, my God, it's Scripture. It's just not canonized. It's, it's divinely received. If they'll teach this to their respective flocks and straighten everything out, they'll be back in line standing with God. They can make it to the scroll of members. And like I said, in a way, he's just putting them in a headlock, saying, okay, y'all never listen to my prophet. You think you know everything. Your arrogance precedes you. But... This time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you on the, on the fly, so to speak. Either you're going to do it, or you're going to know you're not the score of members, because we're not going to stop saying it for the next 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. I'm 63. Moses was 80 when God came to him. He spoke to me when I was 50, though he came to me in my first year. They never said anything to orchestrate my life to make sure I fit every verse of Isaiah 53, to make sure I lived a life of wounding and pain and suffering and disease. Because you can't offer me as a human sacrifice. I'm defective at birth. He said, I touched you in the womb to make you disfigured. You can't offer a disfigured lamb or one blemish with disease. That's what it's all about, man. That all comes back to his wrath on Christianity. If you ever wanted a super duper anti missionary person in Judaism, well, you're looking at him. Because God is in his spirit or within me running everything from my mind, my thoughts, based on who I am. I mean, they're Keith, they, they make me a, a better person. I'm still the same Keith, still feel like the same Keith, but I can see the incredible improvements that they orchestrate orchestrate by providing the information of my mind and they control my body. I don't wave my hands around when I talk. Keith does it. I'm a lawyer. I learned a long time ago from my mentor, don't use your hands. Put them down because that will make you think harder on the words coming from your mouth. Don't try to be expressive. You want to be expressive? Do it with words. So, <laughs> that's God saying, hey, it's me. Or the Holy Spirit. It's an incredible time. That this is what this is what the Messianic era is. It's the times of the Anointed One in the awesome, fearful day of the Lord. That's what's taught in the Hebrew Bible. When you realize how to read it, as it's written for people of antiquity and dark ages, and people of enlightenment, reasoning, knowledge, information, science, and the internet. I am the Anointed One, and the false teachings of the Messianic era and world to come are a great impediment to me in the building of the third temple that prevents utter destruction to Israel and its people. If I'm not heeded, God says when I come, I'm going to bring utter destruction. What he means is you're going to be utterly destroyed by, let's, he used to say raise up armies. Okay? He's just saying it's out there. My creation is going to get you. If this doesn't happen and we don't get that temple built and it scares the Middle East from ever attacking you, period. He says in Jeremiah, 
when Jerusalem is rebuilt. He says she will never be defeated and dispersed again. But that's contingent on Malachi 3. It's very important. And God wrote in, he'll be shunned and despised, accounted plagued and afflicted by God. Okay, that's written in there. Guess what I'm getting from my videos and from my saying these things that you hear. And, and this really is a summary. It's, it's just not the whole book. Um, shunned and despised. Yeah. It, it, it's been looked at by over 800,000 people, and I, I'm not even receiving a comment. So that tells you something. <laughs> but I don't have to worry about it because this is God's day. This is his redemption of the Jewish people. Somehow, some way, and I'm supposed to end up with a portion and a spoil and a boat to be honored. And he took me into poverty. Isaiah 53, he's taken from the land of the living. That's, that's society because I'm given my life. I was told I was given a death sentence 20 years ago from cancer. Stage four lung cancer, untreatable, prepared to die. It was 20 years ago. I, ne I never even showed the symptoms. Uh, God said, I took the cancer, I gave it to you, and I took it, and I took it away after you heard that you had it. And uh, it did crush my life. I quit working, I was just waiting to die. And here I am 20 years later doing this. And he's right here. And I don't just hear his voice, I feel him. His power encases me. His presence is heavy. And of course, the Holy Spirit's here. It's three of us. I'm a man and divine beings without me and within me. They're like two clouds. Here's, here's spirit, an element of the unseen. Here's God's presence, his mind, an element of the unseen. And like two clouds, they floated together. They look like one cloud. But it's two clouds. Okay? They descend on me in this room. They fill it. They fill any room I'm in. And in that room, you, you would be enveloped by the very presence of God and His Spirit, Holy Spirit. Okay? With me, they go through me. They engulf me. 